Item number, SCP-078, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-078 is to be left hanging on the wall of its containment cell and physically unplugged. The sole outlet in the room should be controlled by a switch, which must be left in the off position at all times, unless SCP-078 is undergoing testing. Personnel who enter the containment room should familiarize themselves with the position of the switch, so that they can locate it with their eyes closed in the event that SCP-078 is accidentally turned on. Description SCP-078 is a pink neon sign, approximately one and a half meters long, that displays the phrase, Too Late to Die Young. It was initially recovered in the town of after standard Foundation data mining protocols recorded an abnormally high death rate due to starvation or other forms of self-neglect. While powered off, SCP-078 has no abnormal properties and may be observed without effect. Viewing SCP-078 for less than 10 seconds while it is powered on has no effect, nor does indirect observation. Subjects who cannot understand SCP-078 due to a lack of ability to comprehend written English are also unaffected. However, any subject that views SCP-078 for longer than 10 seconds will, when viewing any handwritten piece of writing, occasionally perceive extra sentences. These sentences are not written in the subject's own style, or in that of the surrounding text, but consist of a random style that differs from note to note, and always are phrased as if to assuage the subject's guilt on some matter or decision they feel guilty about. For example, a D-Class personnel who was convicted of murdering his wife in a heated argument read the sentence, She deserved it for not doing what you said, in his handwritten journal, while Dr. who left his family to work for the Foundation and was accidentally exposed, found the sentence, Your work will save humanity, in his notes on SCP. At first, the effect is beneficial, with affected subjects reporting greater peace of mind after exposure to SCP-078. However, the sentences shift from emphasizing the positive consequences of actions to de-emphasizing the negative ones on a time scale of one week. Dr. two days later, found the sentence, They never loved you anyway, in his personal journal. Moreover, the writing will start giving justifications for the acts the subject has never felt guilt over, or which the subject has already rationalized. The subject will then start reconsidering his justifications for those actions, as well as attempting to justify any further actions that they take. The need for rationalization increases as time goes on, and they will start vocalizing their thought processes, and by the end of one week, any task the subject performs more trivial than the basics of survival will induce a bout of neurosis, as the subject attempts to rationalize why they did not instead take some other action. By the end of two weeks, the subject is unable to eat food. After the first bite, they will spend the next hour justifying why they ate that specific part of the meal first. Death due to malnutrition follows, unless the subject is fed intravenously. A number of D-Class personnel who have reached this stage, as well as numerous researchers who were accidentally exposed, are kept alive for purposes of study and to see if a cure can be found. The sole exception to SCP-078's effect is SCP-078 itself. Any subject who views SCP-078 a second time will see it displaying increasingly more guilt-inducing messages, as duration since their first exposure increases. All subjects who have viewed it a week after initial exposure have attempted suicide. Addendum 078-1, D19384, whose handwriting was an unusual mix of cursive and print, was exposed to SCP-078 and was then terminated after reaching the consequence-free stage. Subsequently, other subjects have reported seeing sentences in the same cursive print mix. It is possible that those who die after being exposed to SCP-078 are incorporated into it in some way. Lesson complete. If you missed the previous orientation, go watch SCP-077, Rot Skull, right now. Or for the complete course, watch this playlist. Item Number SCP-119 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-119 is to remain open and unplugged at all times except during testing. 
The door to the room in which SCP-119 resides is to be locked for all periods, except during experimentation, with the entry codes given only to authorized research and security personnel. An industrial-grade disinfectant will be available nearby at all times, and the inside of SCP-119 is to be heavily disinfected before any testing. The contents of SCP-119 are to be monitored through the viewing window on SCP-119 at all times during testing, and will be stopped immediately should the contents become hostile or otherwise damaging to SCP-119. Description: SCP-119 is a Panasonic microwave oven. It was initially discovered by an agent who had bought it from a liquidation sale of the assets from Valley Vineyards. It is believed that Valley Vineyards was using the anomalous properties of SCP-119 to rapidly age its products and create expensive vintages. Records show that said company was making under-the-table sales of vintages dated as far back as 19 many years before the company's inception in 2005. These sales are what led to the lawsuits accusing the company of falsifying product information and other forms of fraud, which eventually caused Valley Vineyards to declare bankruptcy. SCP-119 appears to be a standard model of microwave in all respects, except that the magnetron unit does not produce microwave radiation. Instead, the magnetron emits a previously unknown type of radiation that accelerates time. The amount of time accelerated is based on the time input given at the start and the power level setting. The time input allows for three digits, and there are five power level settings. On power level one, the number of seconds input equals the number of seconds experienced within the microwave. Therefore, an input of 30 seconds would cause the microwave to run for 30 seconds, at the end of which the object will have aged 30 seconds. Each subsequent power level 1 past 1 causes an exponential increase in the acceleration of time. At power level 2 with an input of 30 seconds, the microwave will run for 30 seconds, and the contents will have aged 900 seconds, 15 minutes, or 30 times 30 seconds. At power level 5, with an input of 999 seconds, the microwave will run for 999 seconds, and the contents will have aged 31,529,964 years. Experimentation with the other buttons on the microwave have not resulted in any anomalous properties, although they do still function as would be expected from a normal microwave. The Minute Plus button, for example, adds 60 seconds, and the defrost function prompts the user to open the door and flip the contents periodically. Pressing the Minute Plus button during operation, however, does not recalculate the adjusted time acceleration, merely causing the contents to age at the pre-calculated rate for another 60 seconds. For example, Power Level 2 for 30 seconds would age for 900 seconds, 15 minutes. Input of Minute Plus would result in the microwave running for 90 seconds, and aging the contents 2,700 seconds, 45 minutes, or 3 times 30 times 30 instead of aging the contents for 8,100 seconds, 135 minutes, or 90 times 90. SCP-119 can be dismantled, and replacement parts can be substituted for every component except the magnetron. When placing the magnetron in any other microwave, including duplicates of the same model, the magnetron continues to exhibit time acceleration. However, replicating the effects of anything above power level 2 have failed, in every model except the original microwave in which the magnetron was found. Although SCP-119, like all standard microwave models, will normally only function when the door is closed, during deconstruction it was determined that disabling the closing mechanism allows the device to work while open. Subsequent testing determined that the radiation emitted from SCP-119 has a fallout pattern very similar to the microwave radiation it replaced. However, Further experiments operating SCP-119 while open now require the approval of a clearance level 4 personnel. Addendum: After subsequent testing, it has been determined that the accelerated time experienced within SCP-119 is not accelerated from the perspective of those being affected, instead causing the occupants to perceive that they are simply staying inside of the microwave for the adjusted duration. Should living creatures be exposed to SCP-119 for extended durations? they could quite quickly die of starvation, as they will require as much sleep and food as they would outside of SCP-119. 
Therefore, further experimentation with living beings now requires the approval of a clearance level 4 personnel. Furthermore, due to the possibility of microorganisms undergoing accelerated evolution within SCP-119, industrial grade disinfectant has now been added to the containment procedure for SCP-119. Test Log for SCP-119 Contents Cup of lukewarm coffee Time input 60 seconds Power level 1 Test results Agent attempted to reheat his coffee. Microwave activated and ran for one minute. Coffee was still cool upon removal. Contents Cup of lukewarm coffee Time input 60 seconds Power level 4 Test results Agent increased power level, assuming the first setting was too weak. Microwave activated and ran for one minute. Upon opening the door, Agent discovered his coffee had grown a thick layer of mold and scum, consistent with the amount that would be expected from leaving a cup of coffee out for five months. At this point, the Agent brought the microwave to the attention of the Foundation. Contents Stopwatch Time input 30 seconds Power level 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Test Results Series of tests conducted to determine effects of various power levels on time fluctuation. Resulting time on stopwatch was 30 seconds, 15 minutes, 7 hours and 30 minutes, and 99 hours, 99 minutes, and 99 seconds. There was no result for the last test, as the battery had died. Subsequent tests using a more powerful stopwatch with a larger display resulted in 9 days, 9 hours, and 281 days and 6 hours for the last two settings. Contents Radis Norvegicus, Common Lab Rat Time Input 60 Power Level 4 Test Results Testing had expected the subject to age 5 months. Upon starting the timer, subject became a blur barely visible in its rapid movement around the container. At 3 seconds, subject ceased all movement. At 5 seconds, subject began rotting rapidly. Testing was halted at 10 seconds, and SCP-119 is cleaned of excrement and remains of subject. Cause of death was determined to be dehydration. Contents Rattus Norvegicus, Common Lab Rat, Small Cage with Lining, External Automatic Food and Water Dispenser, Filled with five months of food and water, attached to tubes routed through air vent. Time input 60. Power level 4. Test results. Upon starting the timer, subject became a blur, rapidly moving throughout its cage. Both the food and water supplies drained from their containers rapidly. At 60 seconds, subject was found to be dirty due to its uncleaned cage, but otherwise fine. SCP-119 cleaned. Examination revealed subject to be in poor health due to its living conditions in the uncleaned cage, but with no abnormalities. Contents: 1 liter of water in a shallow glass bowl. Temperature in room containing SCP-119 lowered to 1 degree Celsius. Time input: 600. Power level: 5. Test results. Time inside SCP-119 intended to be approximately 24.7 years, with an initial input of 60 seconds. Test intended to determine the difference of atmosphere and heat transfer between the inside and outside of SCP-119, as demonstrated by the evaporation of water at near freezing temperatures. The research assistant entering the time added an extra zero, which would bring the total time up to 2,465,753 years or over 4,000 years a second. Upon pressing start, an immense amount of air began to cycle through the vent. The assistant immediately recognized his mistake and opened the door to stop the timer, at which point a wave of bluish spores emitted from SCP-119 and onto the assistant. The assistant began to choke and quickly asphyxiated. Subsequent testing on atmospheric conditions revealed low oxygen and high carbon dioxide levels as well as elevated levels of sulfur. The spores were found to be an unknown xerophilic species of mold. Within SCP-119 was a dense ecosystem of molds and tardigrades, water bears, along with numerous other unknown species, some of which do not neatly fit within existing categories. The entire ecosystem has created a balanced atmosphere, 
and seems to have stemmed from the original contents of the water, air, and the assistant. In light of this test, containment procedures have been updated to include industrial disinfectant. Contents. None. Door is removed from microwave for the duration of this experiment. SCP-119 placed in the middle of a large Faraday cage room with freshly painted floor, using paint that changes colors as it dries. Time input, 30. Power level, 3. Test results. SCP-119 remotely activated, and all testing observed remotely. Resultant paint pattern demonstrated the fall off of radiation from the microwave. The paint closest to the front of the door demonstrating 8 hours of drying, and the furthest section of the floor behind the microwave demonstrated closer to 2 hours of drying. Contents None Door is removed from microwave for duration of this experiment. SCP-119 is placed in the middle of a large Faraday cage room with dried paint. Lightweight floating debris and dust is released into the room through a vent. Time input 30 Power level 3 Test results SCP-119 is remotely activated, and all testing observed remotely. A pattern of complex air currents reflecting the pattern left by the paint emerges, as individual particles float between stronger and weaker radiation. The radiation did not actually apply any force to the particles, but rather affected their momentum in relation to each other, eventually evolving into a detectable air current pattern. Contents SCP-442 Time Input 90 Power Level 5 Test Results SCP-442 continued to keep the correct time during the entire duration, showing 1 minute and 30 seconds of time passing over the course of the experiment. Contents SCP-289 Time Input 90 Power Level 5 Test Results None Permission to carry out experiment denied. Not funny. Do we really need to explain why that is a bad idea? You already know exactly what that would do. O5 Contents Bottle of Macallan 12 Year Scotch Time Input 60 Power Level 5 Test Results During previous tests, researchers have been joking that they should nuke themselves a drink, and one researcher retrieved a bottle of Macallan from his quarters. The 12 year vintage is relatively inexpensive to obtain but the 25 and 30 year vintages are considered by some to be the best of all scotch commercially available. Upon completion of test, bottle was effectively a 37 year vintage. Intention of test had been to consume during subsequent tests, but at this point the intent had been heard by a superior, who allowed the researchers to keep the bottle as long as they waited until off duty to consume it. Subsequent testing determined that the results of this experiment were delicious. Dr. Grant it would seem Dr. Grant is a rather poor whiskey connoisseur, as whiskey does not age outside of the barrel. Your delicious experiment resulted in a 37-year-old bottle of 12-year aged scotch. Well done. Dr. Darrell. I stand by my initial assessment. Delicious. Dr. Grant. Item Number SCP-159 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-159 is currently kept in a secure storage locker at Site- Knowledge of SCP-159 is restricted to those of Level 3 or higher, and access is restricted to Level 4 or higher. SCP-159 may not be used by any personnel, except for extenuating circumstances. O5 Command may order SCP-159 to be moved at any time that it becomes necessary to use SCP-159 to prevent a destructive scenario. In the event that SCP-159 is utilized in this way, it is to be powered by a dedicated high-efficiency generator, and a spare supply of fuel is to be kept on hand. There is to be at least two personnel on standby during SCP-159's operation at all times. Description SCP-159 has the appearance of a standard neon sign reading open, of the style commonly found in small businesses. When SCP-159 is displayed through a window of a building, and deactivated by removing it from a standard power outlet, as opposed to utilizing the on-off switch, the building will become impossible to enter by any means. 
The locking effect ceases immediately when SCP-159 is reattached to a power outlet. If SCP-159 is switched off and then removed from its power outlet, its effect will not activate. When SCP-159's locking effect is active, the structure which it is displayed within will become effectively indestructible from the outside. Building materials will withstand forces that would normally destroy them, up to and possibly surpassing moderate artillery bombardment. The affected structure will remain completely undamaged. Testing has shown that protected structures will be unharmed by heat, hurricane speed winds, kinetic force, undermining, tunneling, explosive charges placed on the outside of the structure, electrical current, microwave, ultraviolet, x-ray, neutron and gamma radiation, and vehicular impact. Persons within a structure affected by SCP-159 may leave at any time, but may not re-enter until 159 is deactivated. The effect persists if windows, doors, and other portals are opened, with outside forces continuing to yield as if they were closed. Buildings affected by SCP-159 will continue to receive utilities, such as running water and electricity. However, supplies will be strained of foreign materials and chemicals upon entering SCP-159's boundaries. Additionally, a buffering effect appears to prevent forces such as shock waves at extremely high heat from penetrating the surface of the affected building. D-Class within the structure during artillery tests reported that the concussive forces rendered by test weaponry was greatly muted, to the point that an open container of water did not react. If a piece of SCP-159's tubing expires, it may be replaced by a matching part. SCP-159's effect will manifest whether or not there is neon tubing installed. Personnel are to replace SCP-159's neon parts if they fail. SCP-159 will fail to activate if it is unplugged during a power outage. Item Number SCP-219 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures When not in use, SCP-219 is to be kept in a dismantled state. All of SCP-219's parts, as well as replacements for those parts, will be stored in the Engineering Division Warehouse on the grounds of Site-43. SCP-219 is not to be tested within 24 kilometers of any Foundation facility that houses Euclid or Keter-class objects. Description SCP-219 is a mechanical device consisting primarily of an array of pistons, driven by an electric motor which can be powered by attaching it to a separate generator. The entire machine is supported by a thorium alloy frame. The outer frame of each of SCP-219's pistons are also made primarily of the same thorium alloy. Attached to the outside of SCP-219 is a IBM desktop PC, keyboard, and monitor, all shielded with shock-absorbent foam to prevent damage to them by SCP-219's vibrations. When SCP-219's computer is turned on, it automatically runs an earthquake generator program. Using the keyboard, a user can select up to 20 items from a list of commonly used construction materials, including multiple varieties of stone, soil, bricks, concrete, steel, iron, data expunged, and glass. Selecting the other option from the bottom of this list brings users to a different screen enabling them to select other substances, including several types of wood, plastics, papers, and bone. A user may also choose to describe the properties of a material that is not currently on the list, name it, and save it to the list for further use. After selecting a given material, the user is asked to estimate the object's mass, volume, and select a general shape to describe it. It is not possible to key in the composition of SCP-219 into SCP-219. Any attempt to do so results in the computer displaying an error message and shutting down. After materials have been selected, the user is asked to specify a range of effect, from 50 feet distances are given in English units, to miles, and set two timers. One to determine how long SCP-219 will wait before activating once the program starts running, and one to determine how long it will run after it is activated. When all criteria have been filled in, the user may select Run to start SCP-219, or Start Over 
to enter a different set of criteria. SCP-219 cannot be shut down once a program begins running without being dismantled or damaged. When activated, SCP-219's pistons oscillate and begin creating vibrations in the air to match the resonant frequency of the materials selected by the user. Different sets of pistons create distinct resonances. These materials begin to vibrate in turn as they are struck by airwaves, eventually shattering or otherwise coming apart from the strain put on them by the oscillations. The waves created by each oscillator do not seem to have any effect on each other, even when they are traveling through the same media, enabling SCP-219 to resonate with many materials simultaneously. Studies of how this is possible, or how the effect might be duplicated, have been inconclusive. SCP-219 was recovered in California after an incident in which a heavy earthquake hit a city suburb without any prior warning from seismic geologists. Eyewitness reports gathered from survivors indicate the seismic disturbance had effects similar to that of a quake registering an 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale, over a space of only 20 kilometers. Examination of the surrounding area showed far more subtle structural damage than should be possible for a quake of any magnitude, and the bodies of multiple people who died of massive internal cranial trauma, including several cases where the entire skull had apparently exploded. Foundation agents found SCP-219 in the rubble of a collapsed house, along with some packaging materials and spare parts. The house's previous owner was later found dead of a gunshot wound to the head in a hotel in Boulder, Colorado. Included with the remains of the packaging was a diagram of a large funnel-shaped object attached with a complex of tubes to SCP-219 and instructions for how this resonance focuser was intended to be used. Its intended purpose, according to these instructions, was to channel the resonance waves generated by SCP-219 on a much more linear trajectory, increasing the range of the machine in a single direction by percent. The instructions suggest several applications for this attachment, including a makeshift offensive wave cannon, a tunnel carving device, and a resonant annihilator function, created by turning the focuser downwards that is, towards the ground and parallel to the direction of Earth's gravitational pull, and keying the composition of the Earth's core into SCP-219. The search for this missing attachment is still ongoing. Addendum For those who wish to use SCP-219 for demolition purposes, note that SCP-219 will work most effectively if it is on level, solid ground. Also note that for buildings utilizing an internal metal frame for support, SCP-219 is better used to target the frame than the materials built around it. If SCP-219 is still running but the vibrations appear to have stopped, disconnect the power supply and check to see if the oscillators have ground away the surface underneath themselves. They may not work properly if the ground the machine is set on is also shaking. You may need to move SCP-219 to a more durable foundation to ensure that it works properly. Consult User Manual 219-01 for more information. Dr. Chung Addendum Despite the obvious similarities to Nikola Tesla's earthquake machine, SCP-219 clearly must have been built at least years after Tesla's data expunged. Given what we know about data expunged, it is most likely that whoever built SCP-219 simply took Tesla's designs and expanded on them. Dr. Chung Item Number SCP-229 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures No electrical devices of any kind are allowed inside or within 30 meters of the containment area. Any and all personnel entering the containment area are to be clad in lead-lined clothing and helmets. Anything found to be infested by SCP-229 is to be immediately incinerated and the resulting ash and debris contained and disposed of under Protocol XJR-99. Containment area is to be composed of a hollow cube of 18 cm thick granite, 8 meters on a side, with a single door and airlock. These are to operate with no electrical components, and those components are to be made of wood or stone whenever possible. Any organism infested with SCP-229 is to be immediately incinerated. Any items or staff exiting the containment area must be scanned and cleared by site security. Description 
SCP-229 appears to be a mass of wires and cables. Superficially, they appear to be raw copper wire, insulated ethernet cable, phone cable, power lines, and many other forms of electrical cable. The current mass weighs 94 kilograms at last measurement. SCP-229 is tentatively identified as a form of silicone-based life. SCP-229 is a highly invasive parasite, attacking anything carrying even a low electrical current. SCP-229 will grow several centimeters every hour and form connectors to attach to electrical power sources, wall socket plugs, USB connectors, etc. SCP-229 will also splice itself into power lines and existing wires if no connection is available. SCP-229 appears to feed off electricity. SCP-229 appears to go dormant when not in the presence of an electrical source. Any electrical current entering within 30 meters, no matter how small, will immediately cause SCP-229 to grow in the direction of the electricity. Questions regarding the possible intelligence and sensory organs of SCP-229 are still under investigation. SCP-229 appears to grow best on metal or plastic, but is very capable of infesting living tissue. In vertebrate animals, SCP-229 will quickly penetrate the epidermis and other tissues, attaching to and enveloping the spine. SCP-229 will then grow along nerve pathways and up into the brain attaching and infesting it within a few days. This process appears to be extremely painful and can cause very erratic behavior. When the infested subject nears death, usually from massive internal bleeding and brain damage, SCP-229 will exit the body by puncturing through the skin and attaching to any nearby structures, thus beginning the cycle again. It is theorized that SCP-229 has always been present in our ecosystem but that the technological level, and thereby the availability of electricity, was insufficient to allow its spread. With the current prevalence of wires and other electrical devices, detection can be extremely difficult. Incineration is currently the best means for SCP-229 removal. Addendum At this time, cross-experimentation between SCP-229 and SCP-217 is allowed only with O5 approval. Item Number SCP-270 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Due to SCP-270's immovable nature, a structure has been built around it that outwardly appears to be a large farmhouse, henceforth called Outpost Delta. Outpost Delta is to be staffed with trained personnel. Extensive records of SCP-270's ciphers are kept at Site-11. If the security of Outpost Delta is compromised, SCP-270 is to be destroyed, along with all on-base records of verified or unverified information accumulated, and manuscripts outlining various encryptions SCP-270 has used. Description SCP-270 is a nondescript black phone of mid-20th century make. There were no human populations at the location of discovery and SCP-270 itself was well hidden by surrounding native vegetation. The unusual properties of SCP-270 were apparent upon discovering that the power cord extended an indefinite length into the soil directly below SCP-270, despite which a steady voice was speaking through the earphone. Investigations regarding how long the cord is have since been officially discontinued. What makes SCP-270 of continued interest is the audio stream from the earphone, which has since been discovered to contain encrypted messages that are of value to the Foundation. Said ciphers are referred to as SCP-271. For the most part, SCP-271 consists of a mildly distorted human voice speaking in a steady monotone, which has been recorded listing names, cryptic phrases, patterns of numbers, quotes, mangled quotes, strings of letters, data expunged, incomprehensible words, sounds that cannot be produced by any known animal that continue for extended amounts of time, monologues, nursery rhymes, leading to speculation as to whether or not the narrator is in fact human, etc. The following has also been recorded. Melodies, metallic scraping noises, 
metallic scraping noises that have been looped and recalibrated so they play roughly in the same tune as several classical music tunes and a handful of data expunged. Morse code, human screaming, various computer programming languages, every known language on Earth, including in one incident, Pig Latin, data expunged, possibly of biological origin, condescending laughter, music, music played backwards, conversations that have evidently been recorded ranging from politically significant and extensively protected area to what was most likely an average household, discussing what grocery supplies to buy from the supermarket, static, ambient soundtracks, etc. Following is an approximate one minute long demonstrative sample of SCP-271. SCP-270 is otherwise a perfectly normal phone and is susceptible to damage, as similar phones would be. Disassembly has not uncovered the source of SCP-270's unusual properties. Attempts to decipher SCP-271 have yielded partial successes. In one notable case, a complicated cipher proved to be an intensive description of an SCP's imminent attempt to breach containment. Containment breach was accordingly prevented. Decoded portions have alternately been startlingly useful to the Foundation, and immensely frustrating to both personnel working on SCP-271 and Foundation officials. For example, one several-hour study of what seemed to be a significant cipher proved to translate into a long and painstakingly thorough list of extremely unofficial synonyms for a human data expunged. Likewise. Information gained from SCP-271 has both prevented a possible XK-class end-of-the-world scenario and listed secret ingredients of Dr. R's widely praised cherry pie. As it is impossible to determine how useful portions of SCP-271 will be, personnel are advised to choose whatever segment of SCP-271 they deem to be most promising. However, some portions of Cypher are either too intricately encrypted for our most perspicacious personnel to decode, or indeed may hold no meaning at all. Attempts to decode SCP-271 are continually ongoing. Addendum 270-A A probe was extended a total of meters along the wire before the maximum extension length was reached. The matter has since been declared not of sufficient interest to merit a more thorough examination. Addendum 270-B as of the unidentified female voice of SCP-271 stuttered for several seconds before breaking down into what researchers described as disconsolate sobs, pleading to be data expunged. This continued for several more seconds before audio cut off abruptly to an excerpt of SCP-271. Immediately afterwards, SCP-271 proceeded as usual the only noticeable difference being that the voice narrating SCP-271 was male. Addendum 270-C Further examinations reveal that this was in fact not silence, but audio stimuli both too high or too low pitched for human perception. Numerous additional unidentified languages have been discovered upon supplying Outpost Delta with appropriate audio equipment. Addendum 270-D As of late, SCP-271 has been becoming noticeably more difficult to decode. This includes utilizing more convoluted methods of encryption, loud background noises being added while the narrator is speaking, multiple voices speaking at once, and, in one case, loud, extremely personal details about Dr. A, 
who was visibly shaken by the event. Morale has since plummeted, while stress levels have skyrocketed. A computer program has been coded in order to automatically decode portions of SCP-271. A recreation wing has been added to Outpost Delta. Addendum 270E Data Processor 271 has been discontinued. All attempts to electronically resolve portions of SCP-271 have thus far failed. Note by Dr. As of late, concerns have arisen regarding the psychological states of personnel working on SCP-270. What I'm talking about, of course, are the natural issues that arise when you have a situation like this. Namely, putting a bunch of highly intelligent, motivated, tenacious people together and ordering them to solve a puzzle that may or may not have a solution, and telling them that lives may depend upon their success or failure. Recently, Dr. by some superhuman effort, cracked several minutes worth of cipher that had been discarded by communal agreement as a dud, and data expunged, resulting in the aversion of an end-of-the-world scenario. This has not been beneficial for the mental states of many personnel, as every dud they discard may contain information regarding an equally disastrous event. Since then, there have been rapidly emerging paranoia and or obsession-related disorders. Some personnel are beginning to insist that the most trivial details of the cipher contain important messages. Others have not slept or eaten in days in their pursuits, and still others have suffered from psychotic breakdowns. Outpost Delta has since been supplied with more personnel in an attempt to spread the workload more thinly. However, the effects of having a few days of diligent work crumble into a dud, repeatedly, have proven to be an absolute disaster for morale and, at times, mental stability. Currently, we only have enough staff to decode roughly percent of the cipher. So far, reassigning personnel after a prolonged stay at Outpost Delta, applying Class A amnestics, and returning them to work on 271 at the end of a several month period of low pressure jobs has worked fairly well as a short-term solution. This, however, requires a rather large number of personnel to be continually circulating in and out of Outpost Delta to maintain the minimum amount of staff required to decode the greater portion of what comes out of SCP-270. In addition, long-term circulation through Outpost Delta has been shown to ingrain certain paranoid and obsessive mental behaviors that Class A amnestics don't wipe clean. I request for this matter to be discussed more in depth sometime in the near future. Dr. Item Number SCP-287 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-287 is stored in a climate-controlled secure locker in Site-22 in order to prevent additional deterioration. At this time, no additional testing is required but may be approved by Dr. Sigurd Olafsson. Sources of electricity are to be kept away from SCP-287's locker at all times. If testing with SCP-287 is required, insulated gloves are to be worn to prevent accidental discharge into the hilt. SCP-2871's remains are to be kept in storage until further notice. Research requests for SCP-2871 can be routed to Dr. Zarshin, and are restricted to Level 4 personnel, or Level 2 personnel from the Exobiology Department. Description SCP-287 is a Viking arming sword, measuring 78 centimeters from pommel to tip, and weighing 1,077 grams. SCP-287 is in a state of significant decay due to exposure to outside elements for anywhere from 900 to 1,100 years. SCP-287 was found in Iceland, alongside several written records. SCP-287 is comprised primarily of iron, with several potentially anomalous components incorporated into its structure. Several of these materials have been detected by Foundation probes traveling within extrasolar regions of our galaxy, as well as probes which Carbon dating has placed SCP-287's creation to around the early 10th century CE. Samples of exoplanetary metals and materials have proven to be more difficult to date, and analysis is ongoing. SCP-287's anomalous effect can be observed when an electrical current is applied through the metallic portions of the hilt, exposed just below the guard. 
These exposed elements are in a noticeably better state than the iron portions of SCP-287. SCP-287's internal components will begin to emit several frequencies of EM radiation and varying sounds, invariably described as distressing by research staff and test subjects. Radiation produced by SCP-287 causes all humans who are exposed to it to experience acute audiovisual hallucinations and severe headaches. SCP-287's specific hallucination takes the form of translucent human-like figures in the immediate vicinity, invariably outfitted as members of an armed force. The armament and armor worn by SCP-287's hallucinations varies by subject, but with a general trend towards the individual's perception of what they consider to be modern armament. Testing with animals as well as non-anomalous EM fields and sounds of the exact same frequencies do not produce the same effect in any combination of cases. Higher amperage currents have increased this effect to a maximum of 437 individual hallucinations. Further testing was deemed unnecessary. SCP-2871 is believed to be an extraterrestrial organism found in the same location as SCP-287. The exact origin of SCP-2871 is unknown at this time. A full report on SCP-2871 can be found in document R27-287-1. SCP-2871's potential spacecraft, designated SCP-2872, appears to be completely destroyed. The current working hypothesis for SCP-2872 is that it was intended as some form of escape pod from a larger vessel. Discovery SCP-287 was recovered from a burial mound outside of Iceland on January 2000. The remains found within the tomb proved to be non-human, and the Foundation took custody of SCP-287, and the remains were designated SCP-2871. SCP-2871's remains are skeletal and are humanoid, though significantly different from human skeletal structure. Additionally, several written sources were found within the tomb and acquired by the Foundation. Dr. Sigurd Olofsson was consulted to help translate the writing enclosed in Addendum A. Addendum A Prepared by the Department of Terra Linguistics The discovery of SCP-287 was predicated upon reports of ghost soldiers in an area outside of Iceland. A recent storm had struck the burial mound containing SCP-287, conducting current into SCP-287 through a crude lightning rod made of iron. The hallucinations created by SCP-287 affected an amateur film crew. The crew informed local authorities, and Foundation information gathering subroutines flagged these reports as potentially anomalous. Keywords Ghost Spectre Crazy Kids Hallucination with a double correlation factor of Gamma-6 Class A amnestics were administered to all witnessing parties, and the burial site was declared a heritage dig site through a Foundation Shell Corporation. Within the burial mound, Foundation agents discovered SCP-287, SCP-2871, and additional written materials dating back to the early 10th century CE. A transcription was created by Dr. Sigurd Olofsson. Unintelligible sections are most likely proper nouns, with no direct translation. I am Halvor Scottison. Scald of Unintelligible, and I have been trusted with the tale of Thor's champion, the Meteor Lord. In the depths of winter, the year after the Great Raid, we saw a fiery meteor in the sky. It landed deep in the heart of the northern wastes, and we followed it. A wondrous thing it was, gleaming and covered in ghost lights. We approached and found a man standing in a heavy cloak, examining the meteor. The ghost lights went dark, and the figure pressed his hand to the outside of the star. A wondrous light filled our eyes as the star opened. He disappeared into the meteor, and emerged to look at us with such fiery determination in his eyes. We knew he could only be a king, sent to us from Odin himself. He would protect us from the raids, and we would know prosperity again. Our prayers had been answered. Daily did the elders of our village come to his resting site, but his tongue was blessed only to speak the language of the Aesir. Weeks passed, 
as he learned our language. When he learned of our plight, he appeared to grow angry and charged back to the meteor to fashion himself a mighty weapon with which to defend the village. Weeks later, he emerged with a sword in his hand, gleaming and mighty. He held it aloft and his power was made manifest. Ghostly warriors, heroes from Valhalla stood around him, brandishing weapons. We threw ourselves to the ground, our heads aching with the glory of these Valhalla warriors, and this pleased the Meteor Lord. For years, when the raids came, we ran in supplication to the Meteor Lord. He emerged, and all fled from his flashing blade and burning eyes. We marked the way to the Meteor Lord's home with the Cairn Stones. During the Battle of Unintelligible, the Meteor Lord's fall came. His powers failed him, and Odin recalled him to Valhalla. We buried him with all the honor we could muster, and fashioned a conduit for the great storms from Thor. On stormy nights, the heroes still come and watch over our village, their glory splitting the head of any man who dare look upon them. Addendum B Prepared by the Department of Exolinguistics Tracing back from the story presented in the included writings, Foundation agents tracked down the meteor mentioned in the epic translated by Dr. Olafsson. Excavating the object in question led to an almond-shaped craft made of an unknown material. Research regarding this craft can be found in document R27-287. Within the craft, several records were found, written in an unknown language upon crude paper. It is hypothesized that this is some kind of journal of SCP-2871. An exact translation is nearly impossible. However, using a partial translation has been attempted. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown place. Unknown people. Primitive. Violent. Untranslated didn't survive. Everything is lost. Must find a way back. Too many counting on me. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several days later. They found me. Managed to put together untranslated hood. They won't see me. Must learn their language. Must keep them away from me. Unknown biology. May infect. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several weeks later. I see their weapons. Mine non-functional. Made one like theirs. Used last of the untranslated. Tuned to alien brain chemistry. Hope it scares them off. Not sure how much longer I can work on untranslated. Not having most likely a proper noun. Nearby is unbearable. Dying. Breaking. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown time. They came back. I use the weapon. Scares them. Untranslated. Almost done. May be able to leave. Down to 16 cells, items, spheres. Timestamp. Unknown symbology. Unknown time. They brought others. I scared them again. Not sure if I can repair the untranslated. Thought I had enough. Closest match was a chemical formula matching SCP-148. Used most likely a proper nouns. Necklace. Still not enough. Timestamp. Unknown symbology theorized to be several years later. Won't stop coming. Only one cells, items, spheres. Left. Time running out. Power nearly gone. I can't repair. Untranslated. Too many. Unit of time. It is hypothesized that at this point, whatever power source SCP-2871 was using to activate SCP-287 ran out. SCP-2871 was most likely killed during the next raid, without SCP-287 to protect them. Item Number SCP-376 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-376 is to remain in the secure agriculture facility at site- It is to be linked to a single underground electric cable that is to be powered by a single generator not attached to the main power grid. There is no need for any additional security measures to contain SCP-376, 
other than the existing security at the Secure Agriculture Facility. Description SCP-376 appears to be an irregular traffic light, with an excessive amount of components attached, resembling more of a tree than a standard traffic light. However, SCP-376 is not a man-made object, but is in fact a naturally occurring organism. It is currently unknown how or why SCP-376 has managed to mimic the appearance of a traffic light. Testing has revealed that the exterior of SCP-376 is composed of organic material rather than steel, similar to wood found in regular trees. The bark that it produces hardens to form a protective coating around SCP-376 that takes the appearance of steel. However, while the bark does appear and feel like steel to the touch, it is not nearly as strong, being only able to withstand stresses similar to regular tree bark. The light that SCP-376 produces is a form of bioluminescence, which it is able to manipulate to glow in the three colors commonly associated with traffic lights. Red, green, and yellow. SCP-376 is somehow able to control which light activates, and does so in a predictable sequence, though it is not known how or why. Extended observation of SCP-376 shows that it has an uncontrolled growth rate, necessitating constant care and trimming. Each individual traffic light begins as a bud, but will quickly mature into a full-size traffic light within several minutes. The appearance of a new light on SCP-376 typically happens every 9 to 10 days. Removing one of the lights causes it to cease functioning, and the wound caused in SCP-376 will immediately be closed by growing extra bark. If left alone, the detached light will eventually biodegrade and rot like any other organism. Unlike other plants, SCP-376 does not use photosynthesis to sustain itself. Instead, its roots will dig through the pavement and ground towards the nearest power line. SCP-376's roots are capable of penetrating underground power lines and patching into them effectively attaching itself to the local power grid. SCP-376 uses the electricity it obtains as the primary energy to create its food. In terms of reproduction, SCP-376 has a unique method of propagating itself. Rather than using regular spores or seeds, SCP-376 is able to transfer seedlings through the power grid it is connected to, meaning that a new instance of SCP-376 can be created anywhere the power lines reach. SCP-376 was found during rush hour in California on a busy intersection. The entire event was explained as an art exhibition, and SCP-376 was promptly relocated to its current location in the Secure Agriculture Facility. Experiment Log 376A Once it was discovered that SCP-376 required electricity to survive, it was attached to Site's power grid. This mistake was quickly realized when on-site staff began reporting the appearance of additional traffic lights scattered around the facility. Once these lights were removed, SCP-376 was connected to a separate power grid that was laid under a specially constructed test area. After analyzing the results, it was discovered that SCP-376 is somehow able to discern which areas it can grow without arousing undue suspicion. All recorded test subjects were reported to grow in areas where traffic light placement would be logical. There is currently no explanation to how SCP-376 is able to control where it grows so effectively. Experiment Log 376B After continued testing, it became known that SCP-376 is not restricted to just traffic lights. After several weeks of observation, it was noted that additional structures began appearing. So far, the forms instances of SCP-376 can take include but are not limited to fire hydrants, power lines, street lights, and street signs. Experiment Log 376C After additional testing and observation, it was discovered that the SCP-376 currently contain is an abnormality, even among its own kind. DNA comparison between itself and other subjects show that it is suffering from some kind of defect that causes it to grow uncontrollably, which could explain how it was discovered so quickly. Addendum 1 
After cross-analyzing Department of Transportation records and total national power consumption, Foundation analysts have estimated that there may be as many as data expunged instances of SCP-376 in the continental United States alone. Containment teams are currently being mobilized to search for these instances. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.